So in this, this particular segment of the lecture on the Cold War in the 50s and the heights of the Cold War, we're really building up. And I, I think to this point, I've sort of laid the groundwork. But in this segment, I'm going to look particularly at the Kennedy administration leading up, the, those years leading up to uh, Vietnam and the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I want to start with the election of 1960. In this election, and you'll hear about it in, in another more domestic-oriented election uh, lecture as well, uh, in 1960, John F. Kennedy faced off against Eisenhower's vice president, Richard Nixon. And remember, Nixon had been a longtime anti-communist, very strident in his views uh, and in his public pronouncements on communism. Eisenhower had not been overly supportive of Nixon. As I said before, they, they didn't get along very well. But it's intriguing that Kennedy, in running for office, and then early, I think, particularly in his presidency, had emphasized that, like Eisenhower in 52, as president, Kennedy had said, I, I will not merely allow the sort of Eisenhower stalemate to last. Uh, I'll not allow containment to go on, but in fact, will seek to push back against the spread of communism. I'm going to be a more activist and thus a stronger anti-communist than my opponent, Richard Nixon, might be. That's kind of a hard case to make, but it's a case that Kennedy felt he needed to make in 1960. In his inaugural address, Kennedy expressed it this way, quote, let every nation know that we shall pay any price bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. Well, that's a pretty big statement. I mean, that's big talk. If you're fighting on the side of liberty, the United States is going to support you. And I hope you gleaned from the earlier lecture that, in fact, there's a lot greater complication to the global geopolitical situation in the 1950s than just, we're going to support you. Uh, it had been, you know, an issue with Korea, uh, with Berlin in 48, and even with the Suez crisis uh, in 1956. You might also throw in there the Hungarians. Are we going to help the Hungarians? What does this actually mean? And I think that's where presidential rhetoric often runs into trouble, right? It sounds good, it wins you the election, but when it comes to what are you really gonna do, you really have to face up to the consequences. Well, Kennedy had promised to end the missile gap. He played, as did Khrushchev earlier, on American fear and paranoia that the US was falling behind technologically. In fact, Eisenhower well knew where the United States stood in terms of its technological advantage over the Soviet Union. One thing about Eisenhower, he was a cool customer. And he often came across in public and with the media as being a bit bumbling. He's kind of like me, I suppose. You know, he can't string words together quite correctly. But Eisenhower was very gifted, it turns out, in offering answers to questions that were lengthy and often quite confusing. I mean, he did this on purpose to confuse the media. And for, for a military man, that makes a heck of a lot of sense sometimes, right? Confuse your, your opposition, confuse your enemy. Let them think that you are weaker than you actually are. That's perfectly fine um, so long as you win in the end. I think Eisenhower, as president, was extraordinarily wily in that regard. But for the relatively young and relatively inexperienced John F. Kennedy, um, that using that lack of clarity, that business of plausible deniability, is not something that uh, you know immediately is a, is a tool at his disposal. So he's going to try to follow a far more flexible policy and also build a force, a U.S. military force, that is more capable of fighting a nuclear war that's more efficient, right, ending the missile gap, but also 
He's going to try to build up U.S. military forces that will be more effective than Eisenhower's military forces had been, or the Eisenhower era's forces had been in the Third World. The 1961 military budget under John F. Kennedy shot up by 15%. So Kennedy's willing to spend money. He's also going to propose some innovative proposals. Among them will be a proposal for the creation of the so-called Peace Corps, uh, especially in Latin America, offering skills, uh, using volunteers to build relationships, not only in Latin America, but around the world and Africa as well, and helping to deliver U.S. aid to third world countries. In other words, Kennedy, I think, very much realizes that this is a public relations fight, and the Peace Corps with using particularly young students and using them abroad is one way um, to help build that image of the U.S. in the world. As to why Kennedy chooses this route, this route of kind of big talk though, even though you know, he's proposing the Peace Corps on one side while he's proposing bigger, better missiles on the other, um, you know, some historians have looked for psychological causes and even gone back to this kind of Kennedy family tendency to want to succeed, to win this competitive sensibility that they seem to have, even to the extent of playing touch football. Um, you know, while at the seaside. Very competitive. Robert Kennedy, John Kennedy's brother, was always very competitive. And yet in his first outing, I think we have to acknowledge that John F. Kennedy experienced a dismal failure. I'm talking, of course, about the Bay of Pigs. An event that occurs in 1961 an event which Kennedy doesn't have to allow to happen, but which will affect his presidency in huge ways. Let me give you some background really quickly. Okay? In 1959, Fidel Castro, Fidel Castro will lead Cuban revolutionaries. And here we can go all the way back to that era of imperialism, right? War with Spain, 1898, the Platt Amendment, the Teller Amendment, the United States really maintaining sort of control over what happens in Cuba. 1959, Fidel Castro leads a revolution, the 26th of July movement, to a victory against the U.S. supported government, the so called the, the Batista government in Cuba. Now, this Batista government was extraordinarily corrupt in many ways. Cuba had become a place for uh, gambling, liquor, um, just a good bit of corruption. It was controlled by an elite, and it was a place of considerable poverty for the non-elite. And yet the United States, because of its foreign policy under Roosevelt and then within the Cold War, looks at any potential ally as a, as a friend. It's less important, perhaps, what the ethics of that person may be than the fact they'll stick with you against the Soviet Union. Well, Castro's not necessarily interested in that. He's not interested in U.S. interests. He's interested in changing the economic, breaking the economic power of the elite in Cuba. Just to give you some idea of how powerful American business was in Cuba, U.S. companies and private interests controlled approximately 3 million acres in Cuba, 40% of sugar production in Cuba, and 90% of telegraph, telephone, and electric lines of these utilities. Castro proceeded, following the revolution, to nationalize this property, to place it under the control of the national government, which is, is tantamount to, uh, to socialism, of course, and then suspended promised elections. And then, in 1960, and it kind of looked like Castro doing a speech at that point, but then in 1960 uh, would actually sign a trade treaty with the USSR. 
In mid-1960, as a result, Eisenhower reduced, and remember this is happening under the Eisenhower administration, Eisenhower reduced the amount of sugar that would be purchased from Cuba for the United States. And Castro responded by seizing more U.S.-owned properties and companies. So we have a sort of tit for tat. It, it doesn't have to all go wrong immediately, but it ends up doing that. And that's part of that Cold War theme of potential followed by failure, right? Ineffectual diplomatic solutions or other issues as tensions grow. So we see that happening 59, 60. And then Eisenhower has developed plans basically to invade Cuba. You don't know, is Eisenhower going to carry him out? Is Eisenhower not? You never fully know. But regardless, those plans are in the works by the time in 1960 John F. Kennedy is elected to the presidency. Kennedy determines... Um, to go with the plans that Eisenhower had okayed. These are plans for the CIA to train and equip native Cubans who are living in exile of the Castro government, to train and equip them to go back to Cuba and lead an invasion of the island nation that will then lead to an uprising of the population against the Castro regime. Cuban exiles would land at a place called the Bay of Pigs and secure a beach, beachhead. Once news spread that they were there, the Cuban people would rise up. A revolutionary council would be formed, and then, and only then, U.S. troops would actually enter Havana triumphantly as basically peacekeepers, assuring the success of the counter-revolution against Castro and his government. What happened in reality was that on April the 7th, 1961, the attack began, but the people of Cuba did not rise up, either out of fear or out of sort of apathy. Within two days, without American air support to protect the beaches, the Cuban beachhead, or the revolutionary beachhead at the Bay of Pigs uh, was overcome and those who weren't killed among the expatriates who were part of this invasion uh, were taken captive and they would spend time in really awful Cuban prisons. It was a huge, huge defeat for this new young president who had made such claims about what he would accomplish as president. After the Bay of Pigs, the CIA, here we go with the sort of uh, special ops and, um, you know, uh, sort of intelligence uh, efforts. The CIA would work to undermine Fidel Castro, to disrupt the Cuban economy, and even at times to assassinate Fidel Castro. But the implications don't stop merely with what happens in Cuba or with U.S. national opinion, because now, with the Bay of Pigs disaster, John F. Kennedy faces an actual meeting, a first meeting, with Nikita Khrushchev of the Soviet Union. Possibly, John F. Kennedy should have said no to this one, but he doesn't. The two men, uh, in 1961, Khrushchev again calling for negotiations over Berlin, a solution to the problem of Berlin in Germany, um, will actually bring Kennedy to Vienna, Austria, and understand that in response to Khrushchev talking about Berlin, John F. Kennedy has gone to Congress, and Congress has actually uh, given Kennedy approximately $3.2 billion more dollars in defense spending, an additional amount of defense spending. That's the American response. Remember, Kennedy's kind of acting tough here. But by the time you get to Vienna, by the time you get to the actual meeting, you've already had the Bay of Pigs. And the opinion of the Soviets, and actually of many nations around the world, or national leaders, is, wait just a minute here, this young, brash, big-talking fella that's now president, he may not be all that. He, he may be rather a hollow leader. 
Certainly, Khrushchev had that opinion of Kennedy following the Bay of Pigs. They meet in Vienna, and when they do, John F. Kennedy, who constantly suffered from painful physical uh, handicaps, you know, primarily re related to his back and in really in some ways wartime injuries that he had uh, incurred. John F. Kennedy is in severe pain and quite likely um, was taking large quantities of pain medication. He ended up basically being lectured by Nikita Khrushchev. You got to think about Nikita Khrushchev kind of waving his finger at the young president's face and telling him how it's going to be. He already thought he was weak, and now it's kind of proven to be true. From the Bay of Pigs and the Vienna meetings, John F. Kennedy comes out looking like a disaster. Khrushchev believes he can dominate the young president. And in the end, it's the Soviets who decide on a solution for Berlin and the so-called brain drain. In August of 1961, East German authorities, and just kind of overnight, will actually build the Berlin Wall, which separates East from West Berlin, and will continue to do so until the wall falls in the late 1980s. So from 1961 to about 89, the Berlin Wall becomes a symbol of the Iron Curtain, a symbol of the Cold War and the division that exists between the superpowers. Kennedy, well his response, not necessarily public, was that a wall was better than war. And in 1963 he will go in a sort of much stronger point in his presidency, he will go and actually speak before the wall, in front of the wall in Berlin, and he will, you know, enunciate those amazing words, Ich bin ein Berliner, I am a Berliner like you. We're all in this Cold War. Here's the front line. It's the wall that separates East from West Berlin, separates East from West in terms of the world. But in 1961 and 62, remember, uh, Kennedy was being viewed as a rather weak foreign policy president. That's going to affect what happens in the early 1960s in regard to the big events of the Cold War for the United States. We'll pick up there in the next segment.